if you are. I knew better than to blare it out. Mike Moserall didn't know how to work the thing. All preachers come in here don't know how to work it, and half of them try to break it. And uh, I think it's what happened to my mic down in Wake Village. I had to order another one of them. It ended up broke. I, just, I think I'll just start making all them boys preach with a handheld. I ain't letting them wrap their, this mic around their head. No, I'm just kidding. Some of them got big old heads on and stuff. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. That door's open back there, and Jerry usually likes it shut. Don't you, brother? If you're watching by internet, thank God for you. I'm glad you tuned in tonight. We're going to learn some things in Romans chapter 3. And I know that God's going to teach us and, and the Lord's going to minister to us tonight. And we're praying for you to have a local church in your area. If you don't, and you must not if you're watching me. And uh, so I thank God for you. And I, I know by the time we get to you, uh, if you're listening to this on a, on a CD or a DVD or watching on our website right now or listening through Crossline, uh, radio or television, you, we're, we, by this time you've never heard me say anything about the offerings. You missed that whole part of the service, so I'm going to add it for a second tonight. I encourage you to give to Crossway Church. People all over the country do, and I encourage you to be one of those so into good ground. You see what God's doing here. You are growing through the word that's coming out of this pulpit. God's using this ministry to increase the knowledge that you have and blessing you, so I encourage you to be a blessing to us. Amen. Help us uh, send the Bibles to the inmates. Help us to, uh, in our endeavors in Wake Village, help us win souls. Help us teach the body of Christ how to live for God victoriously because that is what's taking place here. Amen. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Everybody say propitiation. God, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Let's pray tonight. Father, help us to hear the word tonight and apply faith. Mix faith with it, Lord God. Give us understanding tonight. Help us to hear and to learn and to understand what it is, God, that's going to be said tonight. And I pray that you'd minister the truth to our hearts, God, that we'd find your grace that's in your truth. And we would, Lord, leave this place encouraged, edified, stronger, Lord, and just trust in you more than ever before and more thankful than we've ever been for what you've done for us at Calvary. And it's in your name, Lord, we pray tonight. Amen and amen. Well, the first thing we're going to look at is in verse 23. And the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means all. That means Mary. The Catholics Mary, that means, that means every person who's ever lived, whoever has been born of a man, that if a man produced the seed to an egg in a woman, they were conceived in sin, born sinners because of Adam's sin in the garden. How many of you know that? You're not a sinner because you sinned the first time. You're a sinner because you were born that way. And you sinned because you came into this world a sinner. Amen. Adam sinned before he took the fruit from the tree. Everybody know that? He sinned when he stopped believing God. Jesus said, you've heard it said or it's written, thou shalt not murder. He said, well, I'm telling you, if you hate somebody, you're murdering. He said, you've heard it, it's written not to commit adultery, but I'm here. I say unto you, if you lust after somebody, you've committed adultery. See, the sin takes place in your heart before it's ever manifest in an outward way. Adam had sinned against God before he literally took of the fruit and disobeyed God. He disobeyed God in his heart because he stopped believing in what God had said and and. and, and, and and he started believing what the devil said. And on the way home from work today, meditating about on all this, it was, it was really Adam, what he was really doing was he was saying, I'm going to try it my way. 
I don't really believe God's right about this. And if he is, I'm going to take a chance. See, let me remind you, Psalms 33, 4. Could I ever preach a message without? For the word of the Lord is, it's right. He's right. If you disagree, you're wrong. And there's consequences for disagreeing with God. He's always right. He's never wrong. The Lord has never said, I need you to go over here and do that. And then on halfway there, he say, oh, wait a minute, I, I missed it that time. He will never, he can never, he has never missed it. He can't miss it. Every, and I say this, I've been saying this, I don't know if I've said it during an actual service probably, but I've been saying it on Monday nights in prayer. If God has a thought, and he has thoughts, every thought he has is something he's done, <coughs> he's doing <coughs> mm. <coughs> Thank you. Uh. <coughs> Where's all them cough drops that were up here? <coughs> don't think I don't know. They done ate them. Oh, I got one of them. Thank you. Well, it ain't quite as bad as losing your contact. <coughs> but you just wait till the Lord calls you to preach. And uh, <coughs> thank you. And then uh, you'll see what all happens to you when you're in the pulpit. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I won't run out now. <coughs> I don't know what that was. But I hadn't had that problem today. It just kind of snuck up on me. Now, where was I? If God is thinking about something, and he is, because he's never without a thought, and he never has a new thought. So whatever he's thinking about now, which is everything, see, that's a little deep for us, isn't it? But that's God. His thoughts are actions. If you never had anything but right thoughts and they were perfect, they would always be something that would be done. God's thoughts are something he's done, he's doing, or he's going to do. Amen. Amen. And, he, and, and, and so he's always right. And if we're contrary to his word, we're wrong. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I just wanted to make that first point tonight that Adam sinned before he actually took the fruit off the tree because he'd done sinned in his heart. And that's where sin takes place. But sin manifests and then we just start destroying ourselves because of it. That's what happens. That's what happens to people who get out there and like we have, some of us in the drugs and alcohol. We knew that was wrong the first time we took a drink. <laughs> That was us knowing this ain't right. Nobody took a shot of Jack Daniels and said, hey, that's what I've been looking for all my life. No, you didn't. Nobody took a drag off a cigarette and said, oh, that is so lovely. Nobody's ever done that. They had to push through the uncomfortableness of it, the wrongness of it, because they were trying to be somebody. Amen. Amen. The way of the sinner's hard, and it's birthed right here in the heart. God sees sin in our heart before we ever actually go in the world, sees us commit something that's due to the sin that's already there. And we're born in that condition. We're born in that condition. Everything you do as a lost person before you're saved is evil in the eyes of God. It don't matter what it is you're doing. If you're opening doors for people, if you're feeding the hungry, you're not doing that from a saved position. You're doing that as an evil, corrupt tree. So it, those good works to God, he said, are what? Filthy rags. Because those are your good works. The only works that are not evil and filthy to God are the works that his son does through you and in you by his spirit. Everything else is filthy to God. Think about that for a minute. If it's not Jesus by his spirit working in you and through you, God sees it as evil. I don't care how good you see it. 
I don't care how good the community sees it. If it's not the Lord Jesus working in you and through you by his spirit, God sees it as evil. So, amen. Tell you what, the world's evil. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, that's what we came short of, the glory. Adam and Eve at one time, they reflected the glory of God. They, were, they lived, they were clothed in light. And they, they, they represented God on the earth. And as long as they understood God's place of dominion over them, then they had dominion over the earth. God gave it to them. The book of Psalms says God, uh, he created the heavens or the Lord's, but the earth he gave to man. And he gave man dominion over the earth. And as long as man understood and stayed under God's dominion by obeying that one word that he had, don't eat off that tree then he could walk in dominion. But when he rebelled against God, he lost his dominion in the earth. And the earth kind of got shaken off its axles and everything went haywire. And uh, all because of sin. The Bible teaches in the New Testament that the earth is even groaning. That's what earthquakes are. That's what tornadoes, that's what all the, the chaos in the elements of this world are about. It's groaning, man. And you know what it's groaning for? You know what it's waiting for and reaching for? This earth we live on is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The earth itself knows there's coming a transformation. The, it, the earth itself knows that there's coming a day of reckoning. And it's screaming for it. So every time I hear about earthquakes and storms, I, I just think that's this earth screaming for its completeness, its wholeness, its salvation. And it's all dependent on Jesus coming back and revealing the sons of God. And this earth's going to moan and groan. Ain't going to have an earthquake. Ain't going to have no storm. Ain't going to have nothing when Jesus is on the throne. Because we're going to have the manifestation of the sons and the daughters of God on the earth. Amen. All because of Jesus. Sin. Say a few things about sin. Uh, sin is a transgression, an overstepping of the law, the divine boundary between good and evil, iniquity, an act inherently wrong, whether expressly forbidden or not, error, a departure from right, missing the mark, a failure to meet the divine standard, trespass, the intrusion of self-will into the sphere of the divine authority, lawlessness or spiritual anarchy, unbelief or an insult to the divine. Sin. The Bible even says sin is when a man knows to do right and he does it not. The Bible says that's sin to that man. If you know to do right and you don't do it, that's a sin. Amen. It says sin originated with Satan. That's Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Entered the world through Adam. You can read that in Romans 5 and 12. Was and is universal. Christ alone is accepted in that. He, he alone is the one born of a virgin without the help of a man. The only one that was not conceived in iniquity. The only one that was born into this world without sin. Adam was not born. He was formed of the dust of the ground. Jesus was born of a woman under law without a sin nature. Not conceived in sin. Sin incurs the penalties of spiritual and physical death and has no remedy but in the sacrificial death of Christ availed of by faith. There's three uh, things I want to say about just to kind of summarize tonight sin and that is sin is an act, sin is a state, and sin is a nature. What I mean is an act, the act of sin is the violation of or lack of obedience to the revealed will of God. It's an act. Sin is an act. You act out sin. If sin's in your heart, you live. You're gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna manifest itself. If it's in your heart, it's gonna manifest itself. I love what Pastor Mike Muserall said this weekend. We've heard it, but it just kind of registered deep within my heart this, this last weekend. He said, Temptation is not the sin. Temptation is not the sin. Jesus was tempted, but without sin. Temptation is not the sin. Some people run around and they just condemned and they living in condemnation because they because they constantly are being tempted in certain areas and and that's not sin. 
Sin is when you fall prey to it and you begin to give, give play in your heart to it. You begin to just enjoy what you're thinking about. Or... Temptation is not sin, though. You need to understand it. When you're being tempted, that's not a sin. The temptation comes to get you led off into sin. But you need to remember that if you play with it in your heart, it will turn into an act. Amen. It's also a state. Sin can be a state, which is the absence of righteousness. That's the state we were in before we were saved because we were without righteousness. We were in a state. We were unrighteous. Amen. And it's also a nature, which means enmity toward God. We were at enmity toward God. We can be at enmity toward God even as children of God. Amen. If we become and if we befriend the world and its ways and its system, the Bible says whoever befriends the world is at enmity with God. Either you're walking with God or you're against God. It's that simple. Jesus said you're either with me or against me. You're either for me or against me. No, nope. we need to stay there for a minute. We're either for him or we're against him. There's no middle ground. We're either in agreement with him, walking with him, trusting him, or we're disagreeing with him and we're refusing to walk with him. And that's where a, a lot of Christianity is today, even though their lips say the right thing. Jesus said that, you worship me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. So I wanted to say that a, a few things about sin because... For the hyper-grace folks, the grace revolution folks, jo Joseph Prince and those other guys that are out there tied up with that and several, many, many people are, are joining forces in that great deception today. And that's what it is. It's a great deception. First, first John chapter 1 is about them. That's what that first chapter is about them, believers who've been carried off in something false. And do you know what God in that first chapter of First John calls them liars. Liars. If you say you have fellowship, yet you walk in darkness, you lie and do not the truth. He calls them liars. God does. Because they're, it, once, they, once they put their faith in that they're in Christ, hidden in God, seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father, and that's what their faith is in, Instead of what Christ did at Calvary, they're off track again. You see how easy that is? Your faith, we believe because the Bible says we are in Christ, hidden in God, at the right hand of the Father. That's what the Bible says about it. But that's not what our faith is in. Our faith is in the sacrifice. God requires our faith be in the sacrifice before he came and after he came. It's faith in the sacrifice. How do you know that? How, why do you say that? Because all through the Old Testament we see it was required. And if it wasn't uh, 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 looked at, if it wasn't dealt with, that it wasn't the object of faith, God let his people get carried off and be captive by other nations, destroyed killed horrible things happened to them because they turned away from the sacrifice and they began to worship the other nations gods this is what i know if you're not worshiping god through faith in the cross you're trying to worship god through faith in something else and he won't accept it and after calvary think about this on the night before jesus died he's breaking bread it's the last supper with his disciples and when he gets to the to the drink he says take and drink this is my blood this is the new covenant in my blood well in that cup he held was not his blood his blood was in his body Amen. It was symbolic of what he was about to do. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. So what are we to remember? His sacrifice. Amen. That, what was in that cup was symbolic. And I talked to a Catholic man at work this week, Monday, and, and he told me, he told me that that does turn back into the blood when they're partaking. And I said, no, it doesn't. My little boy knows better than that. I don't have a little boy, but, and I just walked away from him. I told him, you know, he, he kept telling me he was Catholic, 
and telling me what he believed, and I kept telling him, you must not be Catholic. If you believe Jesus is the only way into heaven but through faith in what he did at Calvary, you're not Catholic. Oh, yes, I am. That's like that woman I walked in the nursing home. She's laying in the bed, and I said, hey, we're just here to pray for you and read the scriptures to you. She said, I'm Mormon. Thought she's going to get rid of me, I guess. And I said, you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross is your only way of salvation? Your only way into heaven? She said, yes, sir. I said, you ain't Mormon. She said, well, my mom and daddy was. I said, but you ain't. Don't worry about mom and daddy. If you, believe, if you believe Jesus Christ is your only way into heaven and your faith is in that and that alone, then you're not Mormon. You're not Jehovah's Witness. You're not Catholic. Don't call yourself some name because your Uncle Joe was something. Don't call yourself some name because your parents were something. Call yourself something according to the Word of God. Call yourself a Christian if you believe what Christians believe. I don't have a problem with telling anybody in a minute, no, you're not a Mormon. Not if you believe that Jesus is the only way into heaven through faith and the shedding of his blood for you. The longer you talk to them, though, you probably find out that ain't what their faith is in. Even though they tell you it is. Catholics will tell you their faith is in that. But then they go out there, and if they don't confess to that man in that box who's a sinner like them, and him tell them to do 15 Hail Marys and 40 bends and squats or whatever they do, and then wear certain kind of beads and jump up and down, and all this silly foolishness of stuff you have to do to make it right with God instead of what Christ did. See, that's proof they don't believe in Christ. If I have to do something to get forgiven by God, then I'm not believing in Christ in his finished work. See how simple it is? And, they, and you, the more you talk to them, the more they'll get angry because you are, you are showing them they do not believe in Christ. And they will choke the living life out of you if they get you out behind that building. Come back, then they'll be headed out there and get 40 more Hail Marys for killing you. The Bible says being justified freely didn't cost you a thing. Didn't cost you a thing. You need to get in the habit of when people ask you every day, how you doing? You need to just get in the habit of saying, better than I deserve to be. Better than I deserve to be. I've been justified freely, man. Didn't cost me a thing. Didn't cost me nothing. Being justified freely by his grace. Didn't cost me a trip to some priest. Didn't, didn't cost me a trip to church. Didn't cost me a penny. Didn't cost me giving tithes and offerings. Didn't cost me nothing. I didn't do anything to earn salvation. I didn't do anything to pay for it because it's unearnable. It can't be earned. Amen. Being justified freely by His grace, that means God, something God did. I don't know about the rest of the church, but we know what we've learned here in the last few months since the month of March when all that began. God's grace is God at work. So let's look at it again. Being justified freely by God at work. 2 Corinthians 5 reveals the truth of that. God was in Christ reconciling sinners to himself. God was in Christ reconciling sinners to himself. That's the grace of God. The grace of God is God at work. That's why if your faith is right, God's working in your life. And if God's working in your life, there's fruit of God working in your life. It's called fruit of the Spirit of God. Amen. These folks out there claim they got faith, and they ain't living for God, and there ain't no spiritual fruit in their life. What are they? They're liars. I love them, but they're lying to themselves. Their faith is not right. It's not in the cross. You put your faith in what Christ did at Calvary, and immediately things begin to change. Immediately. You ain't going to get it all right on this side of glory, but things do begin to change. It's called being conformed into his image. It's called learning to fight the good fight of faith. It's, long, it, it's called learning to walk in the Spirit. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to talk to you just for a minute about the word redemption tonight here. 
being justified freely by His grace, by what God's doing, by what God worked through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I love that little two-letter word, in, because it points to Calvary. In Christ took place at the cross, Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that all who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? You were placed in Christ when he hang on the cross by the Spirit of God. That's why the Bible calls it the operation of God. Do you understand that? Well, if I was placed in his body on the cross, I, man, that was 2,000 years before I even got here. I'm talking about the plan of God, the will of God. The mind of God, the way God sees it, the way we better see it and believe it. That you, when you believed, you were placed inside of Christ on the cross. When did that take place? Before the foundation of the world. Ephesians teaches that you were found in Him before the foundation of the world. The Bible teaches that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Well, he didn't get slain really till on a hill called Calvary some 2,000 years ago, which was what? 4,000 years passed before that. Isn't that right? But God says in his word, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. That means because God, before he even made the big ball of dirt and got a little piece of mud and made us, we're just... Dirt balls, don't forget it. It ain't nothing about you special but that hope of glory in you. That earth and treasure in you. But before God did any of that, he had his plan already laid out. Before he put Adam here and Adam blew it and we all blew it and we, we showed up and we blew it even more than Adam, God already had it fixed way back here. The lamb was already slain. That ought to help you understand how all God's works are done in truth. Even his creative power over creating the earth was done because the truth had already been laid. See, the foundation that everything God will ever do toward man, for man, in man, through man, is based on that foundation that was laid before he ever made the ball of dirt and put us on it. See, everything's built. All God's works are done in that truth. You understand that? All his works are done in that truth. When Adam and Eve messed up, sinned, God showed up and preached a message of the foundation he'd already laid. And then one day, that came, and he came, Jesus came, and did finish the work that the Bible says in Hebrews were finished from the foundation of the world. But Jesus had to show up and manifest that finished work. And you and I are called to walk out that finished work. Are you with me tonight? And that was our redemption, what he did there. He redeemed us by laying his life down. He redeemed me and you. He paid the price for us. And it's called propitiation. We'll get that in a minute, maybe. Redemption means to deliver by paying a price. The New Testament records the fulfillment of the Old Testament types and prophecy of redemption through the sacrifice of Christ. The, this complete truth is set forth in the three words which are translated redemption. And those words are, I like this, agorazo, A-G-O-R-A-Z-O. A, that probably ain't how you pronounce it, and ain't nobody from Texas can pronounce it right. But agorazo, or let's just say agorazo, means to purchase in the market. This is one of the, this is one of the uh, uh, definitions or translations of the word redemption. is agorazo, and it means to purchase in the market. The next one is ex agorazo, and it means to buy out of the market. And the third one is L-U-T-R-O-O, -O, a true, and it means to loose, to set free by paying the price. And it's like if, if, you, if you were in prison, let's just call Walmart the supermarket, and we'll call it the supermarket of sin, and you were in there and couldn't get out. You were bound in your sin. 
That first word, agorazo, to purchase in the market, Jesus came to the market of sin. He didn't cry out from heaven. God created everything he created by the words that he spoke, but he couldn't save you by speaking the word. He had to save you by giving his son on your behalf to do a literal work for you, to redeem you. Man sinned. Man had to pay the price for sin. The price for sin was death, and, and there was no man to pay that price because all were guilty. So it would take a man that wasn't guilty to pay the price. God had to become a man and to pay the price, to redeem us. And he came to the market of sin. And you and I were nothing but slaves bound in our sin. We could not free ourselves if we all got together and tried to figure it out. And all of our wisdom, we could not do anything but make a bigger mess of it. So, uh, agarazo means to purchase in the market. And the underlying thought here is of a slave market. And, and we were sold under sin. How many of you know when Adam sinned, he sold his soul? He sold himself to the devil. And the Bible says in Romans 7, 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Sold under sin. We were sold. We, the Bible says, Jesus, born of a woman, Galatians 4, 4, born of a woman under law. We we're all born under the law. Everybody, not just Jewish people, we're all born under the law. And because we're under the law, that means we're sinners. Because the law is nothing but a ministry of condemnation. The law was sent to show us just how exceedingly sinful we really are, how pitiful we really are, and how much we need a Savior. That's what the law was sent for. Kind of quiet in here tonight. That's all right. I'm happy. So, agarazo means to purchase in the market. Jesus came from heaven to this supermarket of sin we're living in to get us, to purchase us. The second word uh, redemption is translated as is exo, exagarazo, and it means to buy out of the market. What he did on the cross was the payment to get you out. You don't have to stay a sinner. You don't have to say, stay guilty, living in shame and fear. You don't have to stay in the bondage that sin brings. You can be forgiven of all sin. And you can have shame gone. And, and we don't have to worry about our families. They'll try to put shame on us, but we're forgiven. And if we live in the light of what God has said, and God's word is what? It's right, so I'm trusting him. I'm not listening to my family because what are they? They're wrong. I'm listening to God. He's right. And he said the fear's gone, the shame's gone, the condemnation's gone. It's gone. I'm listening to him. God says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. I'm listening to him. I'm not listening to my, my family. I'm not listening to my co-workers in the community. I'm listening to God because he's what? He's right. And they're what? Wrong. God's right, they're wrong. Don't live your life based on what people think about you because they are wrong. Live based on what God says about you because he is right. God's right. Live according to what the right one says and thinks about you. He came and purchased us in this mess we were in. And he, what he paid was enough to get us out of the mess we're in. Eternally, eternally, he won't need to show up and put another price. When he brought you out, that was an eternal price paid. Amen. And the last word is L-U-T-R-O-O, -O, and it means to loose, to set free by paying a price. And that's what he did. He showed up in the supermarket of sin. He paid the price here on the cross and he loosed you and gave you the power to come out. For as many as believe upon him, he gave them the power to become sons of God. If you'll believe on him, he'll give you the power to become a son or a daughter of God. The church needs to wake up and quit worrying about what everybody else says and thinks because they're what? Wrong. God is right. 
Amen. I hear it. I hear a train of coming. That old dude's dead, ain't he? Well, let me tell you something. He's dead too, ain't he? Propitiation. Let me, let me read something to you here. Again, I read it once, but I want to show you something before I get out of here tonight. The New Testament records the fulfillment of the Old Testament types and prophecies of redemption through the sacrifice of Christ. Now, I, and, and, I, and I want to show you something in Ephesians 1.10. Uh, if you can look at that, Ephesians 1.10. Uh, man, it, 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 this is so special to me. I, I brought this out several months ago. I don't even remember the name of the message that it was in, but I hadn't forgot this scripture. Uh, let's start in verse 6. Ephesians 1. To the praise of the glory of His grace. That means what God did. Wherein He has made us acceptable in the Beloved. He made you acceptable. You didn't. So on your next bad day, rough day, horrible day, remember, He still loves you. He made you. He made you acceptable in the Beloved. You didn't do anything. I didn't do anything to make myself acceptable in the Beloved. He did. In whom we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. What He did. His power. His great effectual work and power. What He did on the cross. Wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. Here it comes. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. Do you see where everything is headed? Everything is headed either in Christ or in hell. Everything, look at it. That in the dispensation of the foot, dispensation is a time period. There was a dispensation of, of conscience, a dispensation of law, a dispensation of this. We're in the dispensation of grace right now. But, the, but the, look here, the Bible says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. There's coming a time called the dispensation of the fullness of times. That means it's all wrapped up, it's done. Glory to God. And look what it says about it. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. That's where everything is headed. That's where everything, you better get in Christ. You better stay in Christ. You better fight the good fight of faith to stay in Christ. You better learn to fight now. You better learn to walk in truth today. There's coming a day when it's going to be hard. Amen. It's going to get hard. Harder and harder. Amen. It is. The closer we get to his coming, it's going to be deception is going to be so bad. We, we don't understand it tonight how bad deception is going to be. When you, when you start talking about we we ain't... We're t we see stuff and we say right now, well, yeah, even the elect's going to be deceived. Let me tell you something. Some of you sitting in this room tonight, some of you who, man, you are 100% hardcore, cross-eyed, blood-bought, believing, and you ain't listening to nothing else. But there's coming a day when your faith is going to be tested greatly. And the Bible says that even the elect could be deceived. It's a dangerous thing to be like Peter and to start boasting what you will and you won't ever do. What we better boast in is that I've just got Jesus and I'm trusting in Him. 
sit here tonight and tell me, well, I'll never smoke again, I'll never do drugs again, I'll never do this, I'll never do that, and I'll always do this, and I'll follow you till you die and day, I'll stick with you. I'll stick with you, preacher, through hell and fire and snow and sleet. Preacher told me one time, he called me in the office, he said, Curtis, all these years of ministry, every man and woman that's ever told me they'd be through with me, stick with me through thick and thin, ain't a one of them here. I'm telling you, your faith is going to be tested. If you'll just remember the faith of the one who gave you the faith you have right now, then you will endure to the end. Amen. Propitiation. Back to Romans 3, ending in, in verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness. Notice the, the, the blood of Jesus being shed for the sins of the world is a declaration. Does that help you understand what the Bible means when in, in Hebrew, it says in Hebrews 1 and 1 and, and verse 1 and 2, in times past God spoke to the, prof, to the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he speaks to us by his Son. How does he do that? Son's in heaven. You know how he does that? Here's, the, here's your answer right here. Who God has set forth to be a propitiation, that means the atonement, that means that which propitiates, that means... The shed blood, listen, he goes on to say, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. You understand that the cross is a declaration of God's righteousness. The cross itself, the shedding of the blood of Jesus is, the, is what God is using to speak to the world and the church today. Hebrews 12, I believe it's 12, 24, or 12, 27, 24, I believe the Bible talks about it's the blood that's doing the speaking. The blood of Christ speaks louder than the blood of Abel. It's what Christ did at Calvary that you're going to be able to hear God and understand God and be able to walk with God. Nothing else. Everything else is just a religion like the world's got. If it's not faith in the blood, and I know some people say, man, is this all you ever preach about the cross? You better know it. You better know it. I'm sticking with it. If I end up with two people and that's all we got, at least it's two people with their faith in the blood and God's still working in our life. And I'm telling you what, everybody who said I ain't going for that no more, he's done. He's not done attempting to get them back, but all he can do at that point is just keep sending people to their lives to remind them they're wrong. They're wrong. It's so sad to know that people are talking about us saying they're still stuck at the cross. Man, they need to move on. They need to get into the deeper things of God. They're, I know we've been in this for 10 years now, some of you longer than that, but you need to understand those people are still out there and they think we're just plumb silly and we've missed the boat. We've missed it. But I won't know. I'll tell you right now, they've missed the boat. We've got the scriptures. Nobody ever calls and says, can we sit in? Nobody loves me enough. If they are that right and we're that wrong, then God forbid that they're out there hating me that much to not come and try to help me. <clears throat> if I'm off my rocker that far, then how come not one person has ever come and said, can we sit down and discuss this? You know why? Because they don't believe in the word anymore. And they know you do. They know you stand on the word. They know you'll throw the sword. At, you'll shoo. You heard me tell that story, hadn't you, through the years about me working at Walmart for a little six-month period there that time. And about ten of us were on break in the break room. And, and I wonder if it's like that all the time, why you can't find nobody. But... But we were in there having break or lunch or whatever, about eight or ten of us, and all around this one long table, and this woman just popped out of the blue and said, you know, they're about to prove homosexuality. People are born that way. I said, no, nah, they'll never prove that. Oh, yeah, I saw it on TV, man. I saw it. I said, oh, no, they'll never prove that. 
and everybody just sitting around. It ain't nothing yet. It ain't nothing yet. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw it. Scientists now, they, they, they're, they're messing. They say it's in the genes. People are born with that. They're born that way. And I said, no, no, they'll never prove that because the Bible says. And I done got myself in a bind right then because I didn't have a clue what I was going to say. <laughs> but everybody in the room except that one lady right across from me, and that wasn't the one that was talking. The one that was talking was down here. Everybody just bowed their head <laughs> simply because I said because the Bible says. You know what happened in the spirit? I said, Lord, help me. <laughs> That's what I said because I didn't have a clue what I was going to say. Y'all ain't never done that? You spoke up. You were out there on a limb. It was about to break. God. That's what I said that night. First time I ever preached to my in a congregational setting, that woman jumped up in the middle of the congregation out there and said, I ain't thankful for nothing. I could, I could just shoot myself. I, I could drive my car off a cliff right now. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. <laughs> just jumped up in the middle of my sermon. But anyway, I said, the Bible says, and every head in there bowed except for one woman right across from me. I didn't have a clue what I was going to say. And under my breath, I was thinking, Lord, I need you right now. I don't have a clue. I know, I know what I, 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 something's got to be said. And it just, all of a sudden, the Lord just moved right then and just spoke right out through me and, 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 and said, well, because the Bible says that it's an, that lifestyle, that's a sinful abomination of a lifestyle. And it says that more in one place. And I said, and Psalms 127 says that the children are an inheritance to the Lord. So God would never produce for himself an abomination, an inheritance that's an abomination. And it was over. It was done. And the next day, people run up to me. They, it, the word done got out. Running up to me and can you pray for my daughter? I mean, when that word comes forth, man, it shuts that light. Because see, what was happening in that room was the devil was trying to put a lie out and deceive more people than already are. But the Bible says, see, I love that phrase, but the Bible says, I use it every day of my life. But the Bible says, I t see, I take it off me and put it on God. I ain't got this. God does, though. What I speak, I speak from the authority of God's Word. And if you're not speaking on behalf of God's authority, you're what? Wrong. Because he's right. If you're in agreement with him, you're right. Amen. I guess that should have been the name of the message. He's right and you're wrong. <laughs> but I want to show you this. Oh. The Bible says, and we're not going to turn there, but uh, you know in the Old Testament, the mercy seat typified the cross. That's where they poured the blood on the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant that had the manna and the law and the rod of Aaron in it. Thank you. And that's where God says, build this, put that there, and that's where the blood will be poured. And he said, that's where I will commune with you. At the mercy seat. The mercy seat was symbolic of what Christ would do at Calvary. Nobody's in communion with God if your faith's not in the cross. Even the child of God, if he leaves the faith in the cross, he leaves the place of communion with God. If his faith, if he moves and starts riding along with Ken Copeland and Creflo Dollar and, and Joyce Meyer and all these false people out there today who teach you that the word that you speak is the power of God and you put faith now in what you speak, then you've left faith in the cross and your faith is now in what you speak. You're out of communion with God even though you think you are walking with the Lord. You are not. You're walking with the enemy. As a guy told me at a football game probably four or five years ago, walked up to me and he said, Oh, Brother Curtis, I just got back from a Ken Copeland convention out in Fort Worth. Man, the presence and the glory. You know how sad that is? 
You know how sad that is? Because there ain't no presence. There ain't no glory there. There ain't no presence of God. There ain't no glory of God in all of that. That's a different Jesus. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Jesus of the Bible. He came here, paid the price for us. And you know what he did? He took us out of here. He took you out of here. You say, well, I'm still here. But let me tell you, we're talking about the mind of God, the plan of God. You're in heavenly places. You're in Christ, hidden in God. You're at the right hand of the Father right now. What do you mean? Here I am in the plan of God, in the mind of God. God sees it all. And we need to remember that the next time we're going through something because of what Jesus did. This ain't nothing but temporary. This ain't nothing but temporary. No matter how hard it gets, Jesus paid for your way through everything you'll face. He paid for everything you'll face. Every hard time you encounter, he paid for it and his grace there. As long as you keep your faith in what God did there in his son, God will do great things in you today. But if that's not what our faith is in, God won't do anything in you. Because he only works in truth. See, it gets quiet, even in the spirit-filled cross-preaching church. When you bring it down that narrow, people are like, mm, I know some of you are still struggling with that, but I'm talking about Bible. God only works in truth. Truth is Jesus and what he did at Calvary. There is a truth to, about tithing. There is a truth about raising your children up in the way they should go. There is a truth about this and that. But if they are not all attached and being held on tightly to what Jesus did at Calvary, they will benefit you nothing. Nothing. It will just simply be man's knowledge, psychologically trying to figure things out in the Bible because you can't have the understanding of Almighty God imparted to you without faith in the cross. Luke 24, 44, and 45. You can't have it. Understanding is the knowledge of the Holy One, Proverbs 9, 10. And you can't know the Holy One without going through the blood of Jesus. And you can't increase in, in your knowledge of the Lord without w being willing to allow God to work that knowledge into your heart. Remember Peter said, grow in the knowledge and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when I see the word grace, the Lord's shown me in this that it's him at work. If, he, if he's teaching me something, if he's trying to increase my knowledge concerning his son, it's about something he wants to work in me. Are you with me? He doesn't just teach us things so we can say, hey, I know that now, do you? We are to grow in the knowledge. That means receiving more knowledge. Daily bread, receiving more knowledge, growing in what we know, and then allowing God to work that knowledge into our hearts so we do more than just tout it off, but we believe it, and that is how we are conformed in the image of the Lord, and most of the time, it happens when we are in trials and tough situations. That's what growing in the knowledge and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is all about. Amen. Waking up every day expecting to learn something new about the Lord of glory. Stand with me tonight. Lord, we love you and we thank you for letting us get together tonight with you and each other and we thank you for your Lord your presence in this place tonight God I thank you that that you've brought us here to praise you and to worship you tonight and to learn your word and to be reminded that you came to this earth to rescue those that would believe and Lord you bought us out of sin you bought us right here in this mess you paid for us Lord you didn't call us away and do it you you came for us and you paid the price for us and you delivered us you loosed us from the 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 men of sin and you've given us Lord the power over sin and coming soon there won't even be the presence of sin because of the blood that was shed 
And Lord, I pray that we just rejoice every day the rest of our lives concerning this. That our priorities would come in, uh, Lord, the place they need to be. Lord, concerning all things in our life, what you've called us to do and to be a part of, God. Oh, that you'd give us boldness to be able to share this message, Lord, on our jobs and in the classrooms and in the marketplace, God. That it's just your goodness, Lord, that we need to be sharing. Your mercy and your grace. What you did for the whole world, not just a few people, but the whole world, Lord. We just love you tonight, and we thank you for your great, marvelous grace, this great propitiation, Lord, in which you redeemed us by your blood and declared your righteousness through what you did there on that tree. We praise you for imputing unto us the righteousness of our God. Hallelujah. We are blessed tonight to be free from sin and freely justified by the blood that was shed. Let us continue, Lord, to boast in what took place there that day, God. Let us continue to boast in that we know you and you know us and you have considered us, Lord, faithful. You've considered us faithful. You've considered us obedient. I know that you see us tonight just as you saw King David as a man after your own heart. For I know that you told the people in that day, Lord, that John the Baptist was the greatest man born of a woman, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven. And that meant greater than David. Out of all his prophesying of you, all the Psalms that were written, John the Baptist is the one that ushered in your coming. And you said that he was greater, the greatest man ever born of a woman, yet least of those that would be in the kingdom. So tonight I see us, Lord, because of the blood that was shed and you grafting us in to that vine, that true vine and calling us your own and not being ashamed to call us sons and daughters that you see us as well tonight as men and women who have a heart after yours who desire your will to be done in our lives even though we like David make mistakes Lord your loving kindness, your long suffering, your patience, your goodness, your mercy still remains and we praise you Lord God that although we're not perfect we still love you because you gave us your love so that we could and we praise you tonight Lord God for these great truths that we know and that we can rejoice and be glad in each day no matter what we've lost no matter who we've lost no matter what happens or what comes our way nothing is greater than the good news we have in you And this great hope that is within us, Lord. So I pray, God, you'd make us the witnesses that we need to be in these last days. Each one of us, Lord, without excuse, without reasoning, God. I pray that you'd make us, Lord, the witnesses that we need to be. That you'd bring that spirit of boldness into our hearts. That we might be the representatives of you as we should be. We just praise you tonight. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody needs prayer, I'll be glad to pray with you before you leave tonight. If you need anything at all from the Lord, come and let us agree together and trust the Lord, for He is faithful.